Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm David Hall. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. I work in natural language processing. Uh, today, I want to talk about, um, give you an introduction to natural language processing in Scala, um, focusing on um, the Scala NLP ecosystem. So this is a set of libraries that we've developed, um, uh, starting from a line uh, linear algebra library, Breeze, um, to a natural language processing epic to an extremely fast uh, natural language parser called Puck. Um, so Breeze um, offers linear algebra, scientific computing, um, and numerical optimization, uh, while Epic is uh, natural language processing and also structured prediction. Um, and Puck offers um, an incredibly fast parser for English that parses um, over 400 sentences a second um, at state-of-the-art accuracy. Um, if, for those of you who are familiar with the Python ecosystem, um, Breeze is kind of like uh, NumPy and SciPy. Epic is kind of like, um, very loosely, PyStruct and NLTK combined. Um, and there's nothing like Puck. <laughs> OK. So um, I'm going to start with Epic. Um, just talked about it for a while. And also try to dig down into not just how you would use the library, but also how you can uh, adapt the library in a way that can uh, improve the uh, libraries for your data. Um, since often in natural language processing, uh, pre-built pre data models won't work particularly well for other domains. OK. So generally in natural language processing, uh, particularly in monolingual uh, natural language processing, we're interested in annotating uh, sentences or documents. So it's a little bit small, so I imagine a lot of you can't read it. Um, so uh, if you have a sentence like, some fruit visionary say the Fuji could someday tumble the red delicious from the top of America's apple heap. Um, this is from the 1980s when the Wall Street Journal was terrified that the Japanese would take over America. And um, they were scared that the uh, Japanese were going to import this apple and take over America. Um, anyway, so they decided to uh, denigrate it based on its looks. Um, it certainly won't get there on looks. Um, OK, so natural language processing. Um, one of the things we might want to do is identify all the noun phrases. Um, but in more generally, we might want to analyze the entire syntactic structure. Um, another thing we might be interested in is what's called co-reference resolution. Um, so if we see it certainly won't get there on looks, um, to you and I, it's called co-reference resolution. Uh, where we identify that the Fuji apple uh, is the uh, uh, anaphor of uh, it. Not anaphor. OK, referent of it. OK, another thing you might be interested in is canonicalization or entity linking. So you might want to know that the Fuji is an apple and not, say, Mount Fuji um, or Fuji film. Um, yeah, OK. So Epic right now supports um, a subset of this. It supports the syntactic parsing part of it. And it also supports um, another task called named entity recognition, which is recognizing um, people, places, and things. So as an example, uh, if you have a tweet like uh, Chez Panisse, uh, Berkeley, California, a bowl of Churchill, Brene, Orchard's page mandarins, and medjool dates, um, we want to extract the people, the places, and the things, um, as well as sort of the other stuff, uh, like movies and books, things like that. Um, so Adam Goldberg is a person. Uh, Chez Panisse and Churchill Brene Orchards are um, organizations. Uh, Berkeley is, of course, a place. Um, and there aren't any uh, other things in there. OK. So Epic um, has a pre-built NER named entity recognition model for um, English. Um, and it's pretty easy to use. Um, first, you just import uh, the NER selector tool, which is, in principle, designed to let you select between multiple different languages. Um, so for instance, uh, you can load the English model uh, with just the simple line. Um, you can then take some text, and you have to tokenize it into a representation that we understand. So if you have something like, almost 20 years ago, Bill Watterson walked away from Calvin and Hobbes, um, this would present some, uh, it would convert this input string into a canonical representation that's easy to process. It would separate out all the punctuation from each other, uh, un uh, understand what are opening quotes and close quotes, and things like that. Um, we then ask the NER model for what's the best possible um, sequence of NER types. And uh, we get an output that looks like this. So almost 20 years ago, uh, a person, Bill Watterson, walked away from a location, Calvin and Hobbes. 
Um, so obviously, Calvin and Hobbes is not a location, um, but you can understand why it might have made that error. But still, let's try to figure out why, uh, how we can maybe fix it. One way you can fix it is by getting a bunch of uh, data. So since this was, uh, you can imagine this was from a tweet, and so you might want to get even more tweets. Um, you might annotate uh, the people, the places, and the things on all your tweets. So you would get that um, Jane Austen, Tolstoy, and Moses are people, and Calvin and Hobbes is a misc. Um, once you get a bunch of data, you can then ask uh, the, uh, Epic to uh, build a simple uh, semi-CRF, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, and out comes a new system. And uh, you can then rerun the analysis and then maybe get out the right answer. Um, if you don't want to annotate a bunch of data, maybe because you don't have the budget for it or um, you just don't feel like it, um, you could instead use what's called a gazetteer. And a gazetteer is um, a list of entities uh, that's pre-built from some database. Wikipedia is a great source of gazetteers. People spend a lot of time listing every possible thing in existence. Um, so one of the articles is a list of newspaper comic strips from A to F. Um, and sure enough, Calvin and Hobbes is sitting right there. Um, and so you can imagine building some kind of regex extraction of this. It's a very regular structure. Um, and once you've done that, you can pass the gazetteer um, to the CRF model and, again, get out the right answer. Um, there are some dangers if you use gazetteers. Um, so the biggest one is that if you build, it from the, if you build your gazetteer from the training data, um, then the system will decide that the gazetteer is really good and everything else is a little bit noisy. And so it'll only use the gazetteer to make predictions. Um, and what this means is that if you end up with the, um, New examples that are not from your training data, you've seen an, uh, an entity you've never seen before, it'll say, well, it's not in the gazetteer, so um, we're not going to uh, guess it. Um, nevertheless, if you're careful about how you use them, they can be very useful. Uh, make sure you extract them from other data sources. Again, Wikipedia is a great source. OK, um, so let's talk about uh, semi CRFs just a little bit. Um, it stands for Semi Markov Conditional Random Field. Don't worry too much about the name. Uh, it's kind of technical. But the basic idea is that if you have a, um, a string of text, you want to break it up into a bunch of segments. Um, some of the segments have uh, meanings that we talked about, like people, places, and things. But some of them are just other or uh, outside, is how they're usually called. Um, and the way this uh, semi-CRF works is it wants to pick the best sequence that maximizes the score of each of the individual segments of the sequence. So we might, we'll have the score of Chez Panisse plus Berkeley plus Ebolov plus and so on and so forth. OK. The way we determine this uh, score is with what's called a feature function. Um, and the way a feature function works is we um, typically is a sum of a bunch of weights. So for instance, for Chez Panisse, we might say, uh, well, Chez Panisse starts with Chez. That's a good indicator that it's an organization. Things that start with Chez tend to be things. Um, uh, it starts with the capital uppercase C. So um, that's a good indicator that it's some kind of named entity. Um, it ends with an uppercase P, also important. Um, it begins the sentence. Again, beginning the sentence is an indicator that uh, typically uh, entities will come at the beginning of the sentence rather than later on. Um, and then uh, you might include something like the shape. So this would say it's two capitalized words, um, something like that. And then maybe even just that it's two words long. Um, people, places, and things tend to be relatively short. Uh, if you had a string that was 20 words long and you thought that was a person, you're probably wrong. Um, so OK. And then finally, of course, we can have a feature that just is fires whenever it's in the gazetteer. OK, so in Epic, the way we represent this is with a domain-specific language, or DSL. Um, so we build this DSL using um, some word counts that are extracted from the data. Um, we import the DSL, and um, we then start to build up a set of features that look a lot like what I just put on the previous page. So we might say we want the first word, um, the last word, uh, the word that comes before. So for instance, with people, uh, you have titles that come before people a lot of the time. So Mr., Chairman, Chairwoman, so on. 
Um, you might, the word after the end can be important sometimes, like for Esquire, uh, Governor, things like that. Uh, uh, prefixes of the words, so you might want to get you know, the fact that Shea starts with capital C, then capital CH, and so on. Um, suffixes, all of this stuff. Um, and then finally, maybe the length, like I described before. Uh, names tend to be relatively short. And then again, whether or not it's in the gazetteer. Okay. And this is exactly how you can write it in Epic, and it will um, do the right thing. Um, and once you do that, uh, right, okay. Um, once you do that, you can uh, create your featureizer and then pass it into the system in lieu of or in addition to the gazetteer and it'll train and use the features that you designed. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the theory behind machine, about how features are used in machine learning, just a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about a very basic uh, machine learning algorithm called the perceptron. Uh, and internally in Epic, we use a different algorithm, but it, in principle, works fairly similarly to this one. Um, so in machine learning, supervised machine learning, we're typically given some training example X and a label Y. So in this case, um, a sentence, uh, X is going to be a sentence, and Y is going to be some labeled version of that sentence, uh, broken into, say, named entities, like uh, I should. And what we'd like to have happen is that the score for um, the training example and the right answer is bigger than the score for the training example and any other answer. Okay. Um, the score function uh, usually takes the form of a dot product. Uh, if you may remember from, uh, uh, does everyone remember what a dot product is from high school math? Okay, great. Um, uh, so, uh, and so this is how you'd write the dot product in math. Um, this is how you can write the dot product in Breeze, which is, a, again, that numerical uh, linear algebra library I talked about. Um, you can also write it as this way. Um, I prefer this format, so I'll use this for the rest of the talk. Okay, and so like I said, we want the score for um, the right answer to be bigger than the score for the wrong answer, or all of the wrong answers. Um, and so this turns into uh, two dot products. Um, let's colorize, colorize this just a little bit. Um, and um, schematically, the way dot products work is that they measure the angle between, to first approximation, they measure the angle between two vectors. So in this case, um, the dot pro, uh, w uh, is closer in terms of angle to um, y prime than it is to y. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and so what this means is then that the score for um, the y prime example is bigger than y. This isn't what we want. So um, what can we do about this? Um, well, uh, what we can do is we can add the vector for f x y to w, uh, getting a new vector w prime. And it'll happen that, um, just because of the properties of dot products, that the dot product will be uh, between w prime, which is w plus f x y, uh, is bigger than the dot product of than, uh, than the dot product of just w and f x y. Okay. So, um, get our feature index, which I don't actually need. Um, we get um, an initial weights vector, uh, which tells us, you know, which is, uh, uh, yeah, just initial weights vector, W from before. Um, and we go through the training data for some number of epochs, and we um, compute the, uh, the, we compute the score for every possible label um, by taking the dot product. And uh, once we have all those label scores, we want to find the best label score, and that's going to be y prime. Um, and if the, it's not the right answer, then we want to um, in increment the weights by the features for the right answer and subtract out the answer that we guessed that was incorrect. And so this will make it so that the angle gets closer to, um, uh, to the right answer and further away from the wrong answer. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, but in practice, uh, you can't do this in natural language processing. There are too many possible wrong answers for you to uh, sum over, all, you, to tabulate over all of them. 
In particular, um, there's going to be L to the 2n different ones, where L is the number of labels and n is the number of words. Um, and so the longer your sentences, the worse this gets. Um, it turns out that there are dynamic programs that exist uh, that can either compute this, uh, the maximum such sequence or uh, the sum of over all possible sequences. Um, and this assumes that the feature function has the same nice form that I just talked about, where it breaks up into uh, individual components for each of the segments. OK. Um, so how does the structured perceptron work? So it's just the same basic setup. We have our initial weight vector. And we go through the training data. Um, and instead of getting all possible answers, we have our dynamic program extract the best possible answer. Um, and we do the same update we did before. And this is how you can build um, a, uh, this is how you can train natural language processing systems with just this very simple algorithm. Uh, like I said, we do something slightly different, but in practice, this works kind of 80% or 90% of what you can get, even with really good methods, often. OK. Um, we also have, like I said, constituency parsers. Um, the uh, constituency parsers we have, I'm not going to go into how the algorithms work here. It's kind of basically similar. Um, our state-of-the-art algorithms, um, we, uh, the Berkeley parser, even though I'm from Berkeley, is not my parser. Um, Uh-oh. I did something. OK. Um, OK, the Berkeley parser is not ours. Epic is ours. Um, and our parser is, uh, we have models for eight other languages. Um, Air, uh, we don't have Arabic quite yet. Basque, French, German, uh, Hebrew, Hungarian, Korean, Polish, and Swedish. And our system is consistently better uh, than the system that was previously the state-of-the-art system uh, across all of these different languages. We're also nearly as good on English. Um, we are sometimes a little bit worse. We're a little bit worse on French and German and Arabic. Um, but for other languages like Korean and Polish, we're way better. OK. So EPIC comes with a bunch of different models, like I said, uh, models for a bunch of uh, parsing models for a bunch of different languages, as well as part of speech uh, tagging models for most of these languages. And we have named entity recognition for English that's relatively close to state of the art. Um, we also have sentence segmentation. We can break up sentences into uh, uh, text into raw text into sentences, and we also have tokenization, just like I showed earlier on. Okay, uh, that's it for Epic. I'll talk next about Breeze, but I wanted to see if there are any questions about Epic first. Yeah. Uh, what is why is such a dramatic improvement in Polish? Uh, that's a good question. It's a mix of different reasons. Um, oh yes, sorry. Um, the question was, why uh, such a big improvement in Polish? Uh, the reason is that our algorithm, a uh, couple of different reasons. One is just that there's a bug in the Berkeley parser, and it uh, outputs the wrong structures as a rule for um, different kinds of structures. Um, but it's also the case that um, our model tends to work better on uh, languages like Polish and Korean that have um, a lot more complex morphology, um, just in the way it's built. So the question was, did we use more data? Uh, actually, no. We use exactly the same training set. Um, it's all, um, this is all on what's called in-domain data, meaning that it's uh, the training data and the test data were both um, from the same publication, basically. Um, and that means that they have the same level of editor uh, editorialization and uh, so on. Uh, but yeah, we, it's all the same uh, data. Question. Mm -hmm. Where uh, timing is contextual, it's not part of the language, it's derived from how things are connected. Uh, which do differently to adopt uh, a new model for this uh, Sorry, uh, what, is con what is contextual? Sorry, I didn't quite hear you. Uh, time. Time is contextual. OK, um, so the question was, what do you do when you're, if you're trying to adapt a model to Chinese, um, especially because time is contextual and uh, you have to infer it? So um, parsing is going to be very similar. There's not a huge difference in the behavior of um, past tense verbs and present tense verbs a lot of the time, um, even in English and so on. And so you can kind of lose that tense information and do OK. Um, we, don't add, we don't have support for. Uh, 
things like coreference resolution and um, event extraction, which, where, which is where that would become more of a problem. Um, I'm actually not up to date on uh, how people deal with that. There is a pretty big literature on translating from Chinese to English. Um, and so I'm sure that people have thought really hard about how it is that you go from Chinese to English. But I'm not aware. I'm not familiar with literature. Sorry. OK. OK, I'm going to move on to Breeze then. So Breeze isn't strictly a natural language processing toolkit. Um, instead, it's a um, uh, linear algebra and scientific computing toolkit. Um, it provides um, basic linear algebra, like dense vectors, matrices, sparse ma vectors, sparse matrices, and matrix decompositions. Um, it also um, has nonlinear uh, uh, non optimization and probability distributions, um, and also linear optimization, actually, now. Um, for those of you who, uh, I'll put the slides up later so that you can uh, pull the dependencies. Um, so the way you use it is it's designed to look a lot like MATLAB or NumPy, for those of you who are used to num, uh, NumPy or MATLAB. Um, we can import the linalg package of Breeze, which gives us access to all the linear algebra. And we can create dense vectors um, using this syntax um, and dense, matrix, dense matrices, and also um, dense matrices that have random elements in them, which is frequently useful for initializing machine learning algorithms. Uh, we have a sort of uh, a DSL for manipulating matrices. So uh, transpose is just dot T. Uh, addition is um, with the plus operator. Uh, multiplication by a vector is just standard multiplication, as with multiplication by scalar and matrices. And we also have element-wise multiplication. So for those of you who are familiar with MATLAB, this is the same as dot times. Uh, anywhere where you see a colon, uh, it's the same as uh, dot. OK. Uh, for the rest of this segment, I'm going to use uh, DV instead of dense vector, or try to, um, using Scala's uh, built-in rename import feature. Okay, so um, one of the nice things about Breeze is that it can automatically choose the right return type for different kinds of vectors. So if you want to add together a dense vector and a sparse vector, um, the, uh, the right density is that it should be a dense vector because it's not going to get any more sparse. Um, but if you add together two sparse vectors, it'll stay um, sparse. I guess that should have been zeros. Um, OK. Uh, and this actually happens even if uh, the return type isn't known at compile time. Uh, so we do dynamic uh, multi-method dispatch. So that even if uh, the compiler only knows that these are vectors, it'll still pick out the right possible return type. Uh, slices. So. Uh, we also support slicing, uh, just like MATLAB or NumPy. So if we want to get, say, the column of a dense matrix, uh, we can just uh, say uh, column number one. We can do the same for rows. Um, these are views of the uh, underlying matrix. And so if you take a view, update it, and mutate it, I know some of you don't like mutable data structures, but too bad. Um, you can see kind of hiding down here in the bottom that we've updated the last row. Um, it's a little bit off the screen. OK. Um, slices, we also support sort of rectangular slices of matrices, and even kind of exotic slices where you take some columns multiple times and some not at all. And it all just works. Uh, we also have this function, uh, functionality called uh, uh, universal functions. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, they're vectorized functions that will work on every uh, data type in Breeze and also any data type that you want to add. Um, so for instance, we can take the log of a dense vector, and it'll be, give us the element-wise log. Uh, it, we can also take the element-wise exp of a dense matrix. We also, for those of you who are wondering, we have a different thing that's the matrix exponential, which is a different thing. Um, and we can take even the sign of an array and get uh, the element-wise application of sign. And we have tons and tons of other functions. Um, all of them have the same syntax. They work uniformly across all of Breeze. Um, sometimes uh, in tight inner loops, you don't want to create new objects. And so we also support this syntax, where uh, we say log.inPlace, and it mutates uh, the underlying vector um, and uh, just doesn't, you know, reuses memory. Uh, we also have ufuncs that are more reduction oriented. So for instance, uh, we might be interested in taking the sum of a dense vector. Um, 
And the sum of the and sums work for both uh, floating point numbers and also integers. And it can also work for any data type that you want to add, like complex numbers or quaternions or something. Um, we can do means. And of course, it works on dense matrices, just like before. Um, but sometimes with dense matrices, we're not interested in the mean of the entire dense matrix. We're interested in the mean of, uh, say, all, we're interested in the mean of all the rows. And so in Breeze, we have this concept called uh, broadcasting that's kind of like the broadcasting you see in R or NumPy, uh, where we compute uh, the mean for every uh, row or every column using the star rather than a particular row or a particular column. Um, right. OK. Um, so the way this works, uh, this works more generally. So for instance, we might want to add um, a, a, a vector to every column. And that works in exactly the same way, just using broadcasting. And we can also do um, assignments and mutate everything in place as well. So the way this works um, is using Scala's implicit parameter infrastructure. So the idea is that um, a log extends this trait called ufunc. And then you can provide implementations by implementing an implicit that's a member type of uh, the log object. Um, so for instance, here's how we could implement log. Um, and then as soon as we do that, it'll work for dense vectors, um, dense matrices, sparse vectors, arrays, everything else. It'll just work automatically for um, all the built-in types. Um, so if you wanted to add your own, add one also works same way. Very simple. OK. So uh, Breeze offers a lot of flexibility. You can do a lot of different things with Breeze in a very simple syntax. Um, and you might expect that you're going to pay a lot for, uh, in terms of performance, uh, since this is a relatively expressive syntax. But it turns out that Breeze is actually about the fastest, uh, has about the fastest linear algebra library on the JVM. So uh, this is uh, some benchmarks that were done by uh, Databricks when they were evaluating adding uh, Breeze as a dependency for their MLlib, which is part of Spark. And you can see that we are much faster than um, all of the major components uh, for, uh, uh, on the JVM. We're tied, actually, with uh, MTJ. We use the same backend as MTJ for dense uh, linear algebra. Um, but MTJ is LGPL'd, and so some people, including Spark, didn't want to use it. Um, on sparse dense multiply, we, um, again, are also the fastest. We're much, much, much faster than Mahout. Um, but even we're faster than Apache Commons. And even libraries like JBlast don't provide any sparse functionality at all. Um, and again, on sparse dense addition, um, uh, Apache Commons is doing really poorly. Mahout's doing great. Um, but we're still just a little bit better. Okay. Um, so here's an example of an algorithm that you might be interested in implementing. Uh, this is called non-negative matrix factorization. The idea is that you have some matrix that you're given called V um, that has entries that are all positive, And you want to decompose it into two matrices, uh, the product of two matrices, uh, W and H, where W and H are also both, both positive. The idea being that W is um, tall and skinny, and H is short and fat. And so it's a lower rank approximation. Um, there's this, whoa. No, you're doing it wrong. Uh, PowerPoint's messing up. But there's a series of updates that we can implement to implement this algorithm. Uh, this will implement a non-negative non matrix factorization for you. Um, and it works fairly quickly. Um, here is the, um, uh, the updates from the paper that I implemented. Uh, and you can see that um, the updates are actually fairly similar. So for instance, when we update H, we're going to do an element-wise multiply of h with um, wt uh, times v here uh, with the element-wise division of wt, wh, et cetera. OK. And so you can basically take um, a full linear algebra, uh, you know, an, uh, an algorithm that you might find in some academic paper, and transcribe it without um, having to think too hard about how you might uh, change the syntax up. It's just pretty straightforward mapping. 
Another thing that's really great is um, this language, uh, this library we're making called Gust, which is a GPU accelerated version of Breeze uh, that runs on NVIDIA hardware. Um, and so we wanted to, the non negative matrix factorization wasn't quite fast enough uh, for us in Breeze, and so we wanted to port it to the GPU. Um, so this was our non negative matrix factorization from before, um, and here's how we had to change it to turn it into a GPU algorithm. Um, even on a very small amount of data, on my laptop, it was six times faster. And on a desktop, it's closer to 50 or 100 times faster. Okay. Um, I'll go really quickly through optimization. Sometimes in machine learning, we want to optimize a nonlinear function. Um, so here's a simple pr uh, uh, polynomial function. Um, in Breeze, we have this thing called a diff function, which is a differentiable function that has a method called calculate that returns the uh, a value of the function as well as its derivative. And it's generic in type T so that you can use um, dense vectors, sparse vectors, uh, coup vectors from Gust if you wanted to. Um, and uh, yeah, you can implement this function. Um, it's, you can trust me that it's the right answer. And um, we can call the uh, minimize function on Breeze, which will automatically use a state of the art uh, optimization algorithm to find the minimum, uh, a local minimum. And we can ask Wikipedia if we got the right answer. And sure enough, um, to eight or nine decibel places, we got the right answer. Um, it's fully configurable. So if you're used to this machine learning speak, we have support for LBFGS, which is what that state of the art optimization algorithm was, with uh, L2 and L1 regularization, uh, which is machine learning stuff. Uh, we also have stochastic gradient descent with L2 and L1 regularization, specifically the adaptive gradient algorithm, which is this really awesome uh, stochastic gradient method. Uh, we also have truncated Newton if you're interested in uh, doing second order methods. Um, and we also have linear programs and all that fun stuff. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, questions? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, um, uh, Spire is, of course, another, brief, uh, another numeric library for Scala um, that focuses more on abstract algebra and things like that. Uh, and they're interested in integrating more tightly with Breeze. That's something we're definitely interested in. Uh, we actually have a Google Summer of Code uh, student uh, who is working on doing some of that in addition to building um, a, a, uh, some kind of uh, ast astrophysics simulation that will sort of show off both uh, Spire and Breeze, and then as he's building it, sort of integrate them. So it's something that I'm excited about. I hope it comes out. Yeah, uh, next question. Yeah. Have you tried distributing the GPU? Distributing the GPU stuff? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, so Gus is actually very new. Um, I wouldn't even call it point 0.1 release even. Um, it does the non-negative matrix factorization really well and a couple other from distributing it. Um, it, work, it would work in exactly the same way as distributing uh, a breeze object, which is just serial. Well, that's not true. Um, you would have to convert things to an in-memory representation that's not on GPU memory and then send it across. But there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, but yeah. Uh, another question? Uh, Breeze or Epic? Epic. Epic. Uh, so Epic comes with a bunch of different trained models, um, mostly in parsing and pause tagging, but we also have a pre-trained model for, um, for uh, English named identity recognition, as well as uh, sentence uh, segmentation. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so everything, all of these libraries are Apache licensed, um, and so you can use them uh, however you want. Well, subject to those licenses, but pretty permissive. Yeah? Uh, is there any uh, visualization tool that you use with Breeze? Uh, with Breeze. Um, we had a library that we started to build called Breeze Viz. Um, I, I'm, I don't use a lot of visualization in my day-to-day -day job, and so I just kind of don't up, keep it up to date. 
Um, it exists. We're looking for maintainers, so if that's something you're interested in doing, we'd love to have you. Um, but it kind of works. You can use it for basic interactive plots, and it works with Breeze fine, but it's nothing like you know, uh, matplotlib or anything like that. Um, sorry, there's a little clattering. Can you say that again? Is it limited to work on structures that you have to load into memory, like in R, mm -hmm. or you can work in a um, So there's not a lot that's built in that's designed to work in a streaming fashion, um, but there's nothing stopping you from using it that way. Um, but, it's, but I don't have anything that's, that's specifically designed to, for keeping things out of memory. Um, you, you know, everything is, all the stuff in Breeze is serializable, so you can send it to disk if you want, but I don't have anything specific, uh, specifically for streaming algorithms. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, it depends on what you're trying to do. So, one of the things I really like about Scala from a natural language processing researcher point of view is that Scala, the language itself, is very fast. It's about 30 times faster than Python um, when you need to write your own code. Um, and so, I have this hybrid thing where I do some linear algebra and numeric processing, but a lot of what I do is writing tight inner loops for dynamic programs, and you can't do that in Python. You have to switch to C or something horrible like that, and so Scala is sort of a really great balance for that, and that's my motivation for doing uh, Scala. I also really like static typing. I think it makes for a better, um, uh, easier development cycle, um, but you know, your mileage may vary. Um, any other questions? Uh, how do you compare with Saddle? How do I compare Saddle? Um, yeah, so Saddle is an interesting library that came out uh, a couple years ago. Um, it's, its focus is more, so we're more like MATLAB, and uh, they're more like R, I think is the right comparison. Um, I'm interested in bringing in some of that functionality. It looks like Saddle is kind of dormant right now. They kind of don't have any updates. I haven't seen anything since March, and it was just some minor pull request merge. Um, so it's, uh, I'm interested in sort of basically taking the interesting bits out of Saddle, but I would say the big difference is we're more like MATLAB and NumPy, and they're more like R. Uh, any other questions? Okay, great, thank you very much.